Hello, good evening everybody and welcome to today's Facebook Live event. My name is Sam Chikoski, I'm the Sales and Marketing Manager at the uh, JCN and I'm just going to run through a, a few bits of housekeeping before we get started with today's session. So today's session is titled, uh, well it's part three of the Leg Officer series and it's titled Embracing Supported Self-Care and uh, today's session is supported by LNR. So a big, big thank you to them for their support in putting on this event. Our speaker tonight is the uh, wonderful Dr. Leanne Atkin, who is a lecturer practitioner at the University of Huddersfield, a vascular nurse consultant at the uh, Mid York's NHS Trust as well. Welcome, Leanne. Good evening. How are you? I'm good, thank you. I'm good. Good, very good. Well, lovely to have you on. Thank you again. Um, you're uh, always brilliant. So I'm looking forward to this session today. Um, Everyone who's watching, please do get involved with today's session. You can leave your comments and questions in the comments section. Uh, we'll get through as many of those in a live Q&A at the end of the session. I'll be back at the end uh, to host that and ask all your questions to Dr. Leanne. So uh, please submit all of those. If you've got any questions about the broadcast or if you need any links posting, we've got a member of our team in the comments section as well there to help you with anything uh, there as well. Um, also, if there are any technical issues, please do bear with us. We've got our team working behind the scenes. Uh, I'm sure there won't be any, but just in case, uh, our team will be in the comments section, making sure everything's working fine for you. Uh, finally, certificates will be available after this session. So we'll post a link at the end of the session for your CPD certificate. Uh, make sure you uh, copy that link and download your certificates going to your revalidation portfolio. If you miss that or can't see it, just uh, get in touch with us or, or just have a look in the comments section. It should be on the screen as well at the end of the session. So that's all from me. I'll now pass you over to uh, Leanne. Uh, good luck, Leanne. Uh, enjoy the presentation, everybody, and I will see you at the end for the live Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Sam, for that introduction. Good evening, everybody. As Sam said, my name is Leanne Atkin. I'm a vascular nurse consultant at Mid York's NHS Trust. I also work as a research fellow at the University of Huddersfield, but I'm still in clinical practice. This morning, I was once again in an overbooked Leg Ulster clinic. So this is part three of the Leg Ulster series. And this um, part of this series is gonna really focus on that embracing self-supported care. What I would say is I'm here live. I know you're here live. So please, please engage. Ask as many questions as you want. Comment throughout the video. And I'd be pleased to take any questions at the end. So let's just recap really on this journey of where we've been of these three part series of this leg also. Part one was a few months back now. And it really focused on that immediate and necessary care. That's in line with the National Wound Care Strategy Programme. That session talked about what's needed by everybody within the healthcare system. So it's a pertinent whether you're a practice nurse, a, a district nurse, working in a walk-in centre, an A&E, everybody should be able to do that immediate and necessary care for lower limb wounds. That session really went through how to recognize the red flags, where is urgent escalation required? And it really talked about that new way of working, the use of 20 milligrams of mercury pressure if there is no red flags. So really thinking about that first aid compression as soon as that wound has been created. And that's up to 20 milligrams of mercury pressure without the need for an ABPI, a Doppler assessment, pulse palpation or anything like that. So it's relatively new way of working um, that's come from the National Wound Care Strategy. So if you missed that session, I urge you all to go back and recap on that. Also, that part one talked about the importance of end-to-end -end management. So how we treat a patient throughout their leg ulcer journey and actually focusing on the bit that often we miss within the NHS, that focus on that prevention of the wound from coming in the first place and also that prevention of that recurrence on a long-term basis. And then part two starts to build on that story, if you like. It talked about interim care. It talks about the use of compression therapy, strong compression therapy. And it really helped us to understand the difference 
between elastic and an inelastic bandage and where they should be used. And it also started to introduce this concept of self-care. And that's where this part three is gonna build on this. The learning objectives to tonight is really for you to understand the rationale, the requirement and the evidence for self-care in patients with venous leg ulceration. We want you to think and consider the case for immediate implementation of this self-care due to the winter pressures that's being faced by us all. And we really want you to be confident to be able to understand how self-care can be effectively implemented into your everyday practice to improve your own outcomes, improve the service outcomes, improve the healing rates for patients, and actually improve your work-life balance, if you like, of helping these patients move through that healing cascade as soon as possible. So let's just redefine what we mean by self-care. Well, this is the definition of it. Um, it's a lovely noun, really, that embraces everything that we're going to be talking about tonight. It's the practice of taking action to preserve or improve one's own health. So it's about having that autonomy in terms of that um, management of your own long term condition. And the great thing that, you know, many times I'm challenged of, is it safe to do self care within patients with venous leg ulceration? We teach many patients to administer their own insulin. And if you ask me, that's much more dangerous than a compression bandage. So it is a perfectly appropriate and perfectly safe. You may hear different terminologies being banded around. Some people call it self-care, supported self-care, supported self-management or shared care. Really, they all mean the same thing. It's about empowering that patient to take their own action, to care for and improve their own health. And it's not just LNR that's saying this. This way of working is actually endorsed and supported by NHS England. You'll still find some great information on NHS England's website about supported self-management. It really gives you some hints and tips of how you can communicate with your patients the benefits of this. It talks about health coaching. It helps you to provide some direct education to the patient about self-management. The importance of peer support and ensuring that we've got this um, a continual and uniformed approach to self-supported management. And it's also got some great tips in terms of how do you coordinate that patient's care? How do you measure the impact of self-supported management for the patient and for the service? So have a look at the resources within the NHS England website. So why do we think that this is so important within the leg ulcer remit? Well, actually, it's because there is a potential for significant benefits. There is a strong case for change. There has been um, published evidence saying that if you approach patients with a self-supported solution, you will reduce time and cost. This paper um, by Laura Hallis has actually shown that you've got a reduction of 95% of time in terms of releasing time to care. You've all, she also showed that there's an 83% reduction in the cost of that care. They are phenomenal statistics. Myself and Annette Critchley published back in 2017 about how, actually if you embrace self-supported solutions, so leg ulcer hosiery kits and compression wrap systems, you can actually really utilize your wider skill mix, thinking about that mix of registered versus unregistered practitioners. The Venus 6 uh, 4 study actually showed that by using compression hosiery kits first line, you actually reduce your risk of recurrence compared to using compression bandaging system. And that's simply because of the brain training, if you like, of that cognitive link between the healing of that venous leg ulcer in the patient's mind and that compression garment. So they're much more likely to have long-term adherence to that therapy. And there's also been shown that there's been improvement in sustainability. There has been thousands of miles traveled avoided, reduction in carbon emission and fuel spent. 
And I think that at a time where it costs our community nurses actually more than they get paid back in their fuel payment to see each and every patient, we need to be thinking about reducing that fuel spend because that fuel spend doesn't come out fully from the NHS. Some of that comes out from our directly from our community nurses' pockets, which in itself is a travesty, but I won't get on that soapbox tonight. So we talk about self-care and some people think that it's just a way to release the burden to the NHS um, and we're doing it for our own self, but actually it's got huge benefits to the patients, huge benefits. If you were a patient with a venous leg ulcer, would you want to come to have a compression renewal at two o'clock on a Tuesday and half past five on a Friday, knowing that I will be 30 minutes late for you at each and every time? That's a huge inconvenience to our patients. The benefits of self-care is that they have complete convenience. They have no appointments. They can change the dressings when they want to, when it's convenient to them when it's suitable for them to do it. It also really ensures that they can maintain their own personal hygiene. They can change their dressing after every shower if they wanted on a daily basis. Remember, it's not the cost of the dressing that we should be chasing here. It's actually getting that compression on and getting those healing rates down to around that 80, 90% at 12 weeks. I think there's also something about patients' privacy in terms of self-supported solutions. I'm a very private person outside of these Facebook lives. I wouldn't want a big label on my leg like a bandage saying there's something wrong with me. I'd like something more discreet. The compression hoser kits are much more discreet. I would also would like a degree of privacy in terms of I wouldn't want to be going to the surgery twice a week where people clock that I was in there. I wouldn't actually want a district nurse visiting my house where all my nosy neighbours could have a, a little twitch to say, what's that nurse coming for? But I think there is a degree of privacy that sometimes we forget within our patients. Many patients want their health to be a private matter. But I also think the great thing about self-supported solutions in patients with venous leg ulceration is that empowerment that you're giving that patient along with that ownership. For many of our patients, compression is going to be a lifelong journey for them. We have to empower them to wear it, to adhere to it, to love it. We also need them to take ownership of their own health because venous leg ulceration is more common in patients who are obese, who have got lack of movement. And actually, even if we heal a patient who's obese with a venous leg ulcer, they've got a high chance of it recurring. Empowering them to take ownership of their wider health, actually you start to empower them to think about more movement, more exercise, reduction of weight. So it's about really that overall empowerment of that health uh, to that patient. Just the same as getting a patient to check a BM on a regular basis and titrate their own insulin. We do that a lot with patients these days. They then get a connection between what I've eaten has just spiked my BM and therefore I need more insulin. It helps to actually control their own individual health behaviours. And that's what we need throughout the fraternity of venous leg ulcer care. So why do we need this? Well, it's because actually the burden of chronic wounds continues to escalate. And every time I present these figures, they seem to get worse and worse every time. Across the UK at this moment in time, there's around a million patients out there with a lower limb wound. That's around 2% of the adult population. It's costing around £3.1 billion each and every year to treat those patients with a leg ulcer. And it takes up around 50% of our whole community nurse's time is caring for patients with wounds. But I think the two shocking statistics on this slide is the fact that the number of chronic wounds have increased by 71% increase since 2012 to 2018, 71% increase. I'd love to be able to ask you all, what's your staffing establishment increased by since 2012? Has that increased by 71%? Mm. I think many of you would struggle to find 1% increase in your staffing establishment since 2012. 
So how are we going to cope with that? Because it's not disappearing. And the tsunami of new nurses and healthcare assistants isn't just round the corner. We've also got a huge problem in terms of the recurrence rates. It's published that up to 69% of venous leg ulcerations reoccur within one year. You've got a question then, really, what's the point of healing them in the first place if nearly 70% of them is going to reoccur? It's a real perpetuation of nurses time. And actually, what does that start to do to that workforce? Those figures don't have to be like that. We can do a lot in terms of reducing the risk of recurrence, reducing the amount of burden of chronic wounds, reducing the time that nurses spend on venous leg ulceration. We just have to start to do things differently. But actually, the saddest thing about all of this is when you start to listen to patient stories and the impact of the individual patients. And these are some of the words that we've collected in terms of listening to our patients. The patient says it feels like there's tiny people inside your leg with knives stabbing you and it feels like hot acid is being poured down your skin. The thing I found most difficult was how difficult it was to get around, especially when my doctors were insisting me having a dressing change three times a week. I have dealt with the same problem since I was 20 years old. I'm now 43. I've now given up. This battle has taken it out of me. It's taken everything from me. The last one was the most severe, and I think the result from that and everything else that has occurred to me as a result of it has terrified me. Imagine being a patient who feels like they're being stabbed inside, like they're about to give up, that they feel terrified just because of their own health. There's a lot that we can do better for these patients. But I work a lot with my community nurses, and I know that community nursing is a very difficult field to work in at this moment in time. I know that you are very overstretched. And actually, I really need you to be positive. And when I listened to my workforce, and this is what they were telling me, I felt that things needed to change. They told me there was only a handful of people within their team that were left who could apply compression. Can you imagine their workload? imagine what it's going to be like they're going to be seeing the same patients they're going to be the ones who's applying these bandages sometimes i feel like we're wasting our time some of these patients never seem to improve how do you give good quality care if that's what you're feeling inside your heart i am so frustrated that we do not have enough time to care for these patients as needed i often feel like we're cutting corners by not washing the leg how does that person go home and say that she's proud to be in the NHS, proud to be a nurse, proud to be a healthcare support worker? That person who's feeling that frustrated that she's doing or he's doing such a poor job are the ones that's thinking about leaving the NHS. We need them to stay. We need to keep our talented workforce right where they are. We need to do something about this. And the time is now. The time is now because winter is upon us. The dark nights are dark again. It's interesting if you read all of the media that the impact of winter pressures is going to be very difficult this year. I, if you ask me, I don't think we've been out of winter pressures all summer, never mind heading for the winter. We haven't been able to do anything about the COVID backlog. We've always been over the NHS waiting times for trolley weights, for capacity, and then we're heading into winter. We've got all of this mixed by a fuel crisis a work deficit and a true cost of living crisis that's facing many of our nurses. I was a single mum for many times and I, at the time I was a single mum, I was a band five or band six nurse. I have no idea how a band five and band six single mum now lives and works. I have no idea how on earth that can be affordable. But again, I may need a soapbox. There's not very much we can do in terms of the workforce deficit, the cost of living crisis, or the payment to nurses. But actually, there's a lot we can do to make ourselves feel, feel prouder for the job that we do every day. Maybe we need to start to think differently, to improve our own healing rates, to reduce the burden on the NHS and the suffering, for you to feel a little bit more proud that you're doing a fantastic job and you're making a difference every day. So what is the solution of this? 
Well, the solution is relatively simple. It's now out there for us in the documentation. We now have standardized approach that we need to be implementing across the NHS. The National Wound Care Strategy Programme wrote these clinical recommendations a few years ago. I was very proud to be part of, of that authorship group and I was a joint chair of these lower limb recommendations. The lower limb recommendations are basically broken down into three parts. That immediate and necessary care that we want everybody to do. The challenge of that diagnosis and starting evidence-based treatment within 14 days of wounding. And it talks about that importance of that ongoing maintenance to prevent that recurrence. And the National Wound Care Strategy and clinicians like me believe that all of this unwarranted variation that exists across the UK actually holds as a major opportunity. It gives us an opportunity to improve healing rates, reduce patient suffering, reduce inappropriate spend on ineffective treatment, and to reduce the amount of clinical time that you are spending on wound care. Myself and Joy Tickle, um, a few years back now, wrote the first version of the lower limb wound pathway. And this has been updated to reflect the National Wound Care Strategies guidance. And the two are very, very similar. And now actually this pathway is identical to the National Wound Care Strategy guidance. And it's identical because it's actually, its foundations is built on empirical evidence. So they are the same. It places that in emphasis on that early diagnosis. It supports the optimum use of compression. It helps to reduce the risk of inappropriate compression. It also encourages prevention of recurrence and it uses self-care solutions front line. We want you to be using these wherever possible at, at the point of starting of compression. But it's also important to remember when self-care solutions are not appropriate. When we talk about self-care solutions, we're talking about compression hosiery kits and compression wrap systems. There are a few patients where neither of those things is the best option. If you've got a patient where there's high volumes of exudate, that's not controlled within that dressing, in other words, you're getting strike through, you're gonna need a bandage. You're gonna need a bandage to help to control some of that exudate, to wick it away, to not allow it to stain through. We also know that if you have a limb that's misshapen, like on this picture, where you've got that unusual limb profile, that soft edema, the best treatment for that patient is actually to reduce that edema and to reshape that leg. And the best treatment for that patient is using inelastic bandage systems. So we need to just make sure that if we've got high volumes of exudate or the limb is of an unusual distortion or significant amount of edema, then actually our first line management for those is a compression bandage system. It's not to say we can't step patients down to a self-support solution, but actually they are the patients where we need compression bandage therapy. But actually, we need to be thinking, if you haven't got a wound, so you've got that the extra day is controlled within the dressing, and that there is no amount of reducible or large edema, these are patients that are ideal for compression um, systems, that self-supported care, because we need to be empowering those patients. I think we've got to make a clear recommendation between the difference between a British standard hosiery kit and a European standard hosiery kit, and we'll come on to that in a little while. So when are self-supported solutions appropriate? So there's just two real questions you need to ask yourself that's embedded within that pathway. Is the extra date control in the dressing? And is there little reducible edema or little um, limb distortion. And within these clinical pictures, you can see that both of these patients would be suitable for this self-supported solution. There is minimal exudate and minimal edema and minimal limb distortion. So when we talk about these compression systems that I've been mentioning, it's these two things here, really. It's legal to hosiery kits 
and compression wrap systems. And I just want to give you some information about each of these as we go through. The, the Legal Hosiery Kit to me are fantastic. I think this is an ideal approach for Venus Legal to Management. I say that because you get direct brain training, if you like, of that use of that hosiery on a long-term basis. The LNR Legolsa Hosiery Kit comes with a very silky, easy to apply 10 millimeter mercury liner. Therefore, it's dead easy to hold the dressing in place and pull that over. If you find it difficult, you can use adhesive board and dressings to help it. But once you've got that in place, the second layer just slides on because of the low profile nature of that first layer. And the beauty of these is it gives you that optimum graduated compression. So long as you've measured it right, you'll always get 40, 30, 20. You'll get that perfect profile. And you get that perfect profile no matter who applies it. So I mentioned to you before that there's two different types of hosiery kits. There's the British standard Activa Legolsa hosiery kit, and that's the one that's designed for patients without edema. And then there is the European Actilimp hosiery kit, which is designed for patients with edema. In simplistic terms, you need to think about your British standard hosiery as hosiery with lots of elastic in it. Think about it like your spanks that you pull on. You've got lots of elastic fibres within it, but actually the elastic fibres, if you've got some swelling, can start to dig in in places, just like your spanks do at times if they roll down a little bit. Whereas the, um, so they're not very good at holding edema in place. The British standard will actually allow the leg to swell a little bit inside of it, and that's not what we want with edema. Whereas the European class Actilymph stocking is much more like your old fashioned panty girdle. The way that it's knitted is extremely firm and very stiff. So therefore it holds the edema in place. It doesn't allow that leg to expand. It also helps to massage those lymphs a little bit to help that lymphatic uptake. So just make sure in your mind that you know about the difference between these two systems. Activa hosiery kits, British standard for patients with limited edema. If you've got edema, we should be heading for European Actilymph type hosiery kits. And as much as that might sound a little confusing, don't worry, it's all within the pathway. You follow the pathway, it asks you certain questions and it tells you when it's appropriate to apply a British standard or a European standard, really helping to demystify those questions for you. So I'm very confident to be able to sit here with you today and say that compression hosiery kits are as good as gold standard for layer bandage. You can call a hosiery kit a gold standard solution for venous leg ulcer. I can say this because this, this large randomized control study that was done by Rebecca Ashby, published back in 2014, it was a great study because it just was a direct comparison and actually, the leg ulcer hosiery kits heal as well as the four layer bandaging. They cost a little bit less, which is great for the NHS purse strings. But actually, the thing that I'm interested in is the fact that it reduces the risk of recurrence significantly. And it does that because you are training that patient to realise that the improvements of their leg is related to this compression garment, much more like this carry on. And also, there's a little bit of Sometimes when we're using compression, we have to tailor the compression to that patient. So they might want an open toe rather than a closed toe. You might need a wider top band. You may need to layer your compression in a different way. If we're able to actually work with our patients while they've still got a venous leg ulcer, we can make sure they've got a compression garment that's fit for purpose, clinically effective, but one that the patient finds comfortable. And therefore, you get much more adherence to that therapy in the long term and therefore a risk of a reduction of your recurrence. And the, the outcome of that paper was actually if we were able to increase the use of these within the NHS, we're going to have substantial savings, improved quality of life for patients with venous leg ulceration. And that's why it's embedded within our pathway. And that's why leg ulcer hosiery kits are endorsed by the National Wound Care Strategy Programme. The newer kid on the block, if you like, they've been around a while now, is that compression wrap system. And I find these really versatile. 
I find these versatile because they are modular. In other words, you can get a piece for a foot, piece for a calf, piece for an upper thigh. They deliver that full therapeutic compression, but actually it gives you a chance to reshape the leg a little bit if they've got some forms of edema. And again, that these are a great way to help those patients with that self-supported care. They're able to apply these, adjust these, um, and wear them on a daily basis. What I would say though about both of the Legals for Hosiery kits and the compression wrap systems, they are not just for patients who can self-care. A patient may want still a nurse because the wounds on the back of the leg, it's difficult to dress. They may not have the resilience to be able to do it. They're a bit squeamish. They may have safeguarding issues, capacity, capacity issues. The house might not be just hygienic enough for them, you wanting them to actually apply their own wound care. But you can still use hosiery kits and leg and wrap systems. If anything, they're a great way because it requires very little training to be able to apply them. So it's not about who is competent at putting on a compression bandage being limited to only certain people of your workforce, it's actually everybody in your workforce can apply these, whether they're a registered nurse or a non-registered nurse. So all of these, again, is just embedded within this pathway. It's just helping you to consider where to use these systems. So what we try to do is try to get patients into a hosiery kit first line, if at all possible. If the patient does require a degree of limb reshaping or exudate control, we're gonna use a period of bandaging, but then we're gonna step them down as soon as we can to a compression hosiery kit or a compression wrap system. Because all of this, as I've said, it's about that link to the prevention and the long-term maintenance. Venous hypertension without venous ablation is not going to go away. Many of these patients have got poor mobility, chronic edema, and they're going to require compression on a long-term basis, even when that leg ulcer is healed. If we want to tackle that 69% recurrence rate that happens, we need to make sure that our patients have got the right compression on and one that they're going to wear. So actually working with them to make sure they've got the right garment in place is the way forward. So. All of this sounds relatively simple, but I just want to say that if you manage to embrace this self-care, embed that pathway into your practice, the impact of this could be absolutely massive. This is my lovely place of work, and this is Mid York's NHS Trust. It's a brand new hospital built about 10 years ago. Um, we serve a population around 600,000 patients, and we provide both the acute and community services for the people who live in the district of Wakefield and Pontefract. All of our lower limb care is commissioned by our community nurses, which is a huge advantage if you ask me, because it helps to control who is seeing these patients. What we were able to do is embed this pathway across the whole of our district practice. We embedded it, so therefore we got a, a, a unified approach to self-supported care. We were also able to count actually how many new wounds we were seeing in a month. We know how many leg ulcers we've got on in terms of how many visits we're doing, but what we didn't know is how many wounds occur in an average month. And actually by collecting some detailed data, we know that we've got around 51 patients with a new wound occurring in any one month and around half of them are housebound and half of them are ambulatory patients where we can see in our local wound care clinics. But what we did is we changed the workforce. We changed who was doing what. We said immediate and necessary care is for everybody. Everybody within our practice, everybody should be able to recognize those red flags and apply that up to 20 milligrams of mercury pressure. We said that assessment that ABPI, that diagnosis, that care planning needs to be done by somebody with a good level of knowledge of venous leg ulcer management. And we call them within our community, the leg ulcer champions. To be able to release them to do the time for the training and time for that assessment, we've actually stripped out the care providers. So anybody that's on twice a week dressings underneath their hosiery kits 
or their compression systems, or if they're having band compression bandaging. If it's compression bandaging, it's provided by our healthcare support workers. Wherever possible, we try to encourage the patient or their family to actually do their own care. So if it's just a transactional dressing change, we want the patient or the non-registered workforce to be able to deliver that. We want the assessment being done by the best and we want the care reviewer to be a registered professional. So the care reviewer is somebody that goes in every four weeks and says, is this wound care plan working? Is that compression working? Remember that when compression starts to work, it's not healing that you will see first. When compression starts to work, the first thing that you will see is a reduction of edema. The next thing that happens is a reduction of exudate levels, and then wound healing starts to occur. But we've got to think about the complexities of wound healing and that this sometimes takes a long time to occur. A long time, I say, for every patient with a venous leg ulcer, we should try to heal them within 12 weeks maximum. And you may think that's a challenge, but hold that thought. And then actually we've got very good links now within our specialist clinics, consultant-led clinics, where if the care reviewer has got any concerns about the therapies not being therapeutic, they can escalate to that service. What we found within a three month period is that unsurprisingly, the majority of wounds out there are venous in nature. But when we looked at our outcomes for venous leg ulceration, 58% of our patients were willing and able to care for their wounds themselves. 33% of our patients still required somebody to do that transactional dressing change or needed compression bandaging. Only 9% of our patients needed regular RN input. And these were patients with the most complex of wounds, complex comorbidities, or the most complex of limbs, or those patients that weren't wanting compression. There's a question mark about whether they are compliant or not to compression. That's when we need our RN support to keep going in and reaffirming the importance of this strong anti-inflammatory device called compression therapy. And the impact of that has been massive. There has been an average reduction of visits of 51 visits per week across our network. We've got healing rates at 84% at 12 weeks, simply by standardising to evidence-based care. We really thought about the value of our healthcare support workers. Some of our healthcare support workers are now Legals to Champions. They're absolutely fantastic individuals. It really helps you to empower your staff for them to have a little bit of pride. And actually, as much as I am so proud of the healing rate at 84% at 12 weeks, I'm actually more proud of what my workforce is now telling me. They're telling me this is so simple. You've really changed the way I view self-care. I thought self-care still need to be seen weekly, just in case. I now understand the importance of that Venus assessment. And my favourite one is, I love leg ulcers. I'm not a registered nurse, but now I feel a valued part of this solution. That's why we need to make a difference. We need to empower our nurses to make them feel like they're doing the fantastic job that they really are. So I'd just like to leave you with a couple of questions that I'd like you to ponder on. With winter pressures coming just round the corner, would your, you say your services are sustainable during that winter period? Will your current ways of working deliver the best possible outcome for you? your service and your patients? Or is there a better way for you and your patients? What if you did embrace self-care? What if you did align all of your treatments to evidence-based treatment pathways? There's many support out there for your patients. I was a proud chair of the Legs Matters campaign for many years. If you haven't seen it, have a look on our website. We've got fantastic information for patients and for healthcare professionals. Along with that, LNR have produced a squeezed in campaign. It's a fantastic campaign doing the things that we desperately need to do. But as healthcare professionals, we often don't have time. It talks about the importance of movement, exercise, nutrition, hydration, about mental well-being. And all of that is as vital as healing the wound itself. 
And to support you all, LNR's got fantastic um, learning modules all available on demand for you, and they're all free to sign up. So I suppose my challenge to you is do something differently. You can start to do something differently tomorrow. Just as an individual practitioner, you can start to align your practice to that pathway. You don't need permission from anybody to start to align your practice to evidence-based practice. Think about embracing that pathway within your service. What could it do to the amount of visits that you're doing and the demands on your appointments? And think about that bigger picture. How would it feel for you as a nurse if you were able to reduce your visits, to reduce your clinical commitments, to give you a little bit of time back to caring? To give you a little bit of time back to doing the job that in your heart you still love doing. Be proud. It's brilliant being in the NHS. It's brilliant being a healthcare professional. Be the best you can. Thank you very much and I'll welcome any questions you've got. Thank you. Well um, that was brilliant Leanne uh, as always of course but um, yeah really touching and um, empowering I think it was uh, Fantastic session. I know we've had lots and lots of questions through, so I'll uh, I'll get straight on to those. Uh, everyone who sent them through, thank you very much so far, but do continue to send them through. If we don't get through all of them, we'll, we'll try and answer them in the next couple of days as well. So question one is from Nessa. Uh, how do you get the nurse who won't give up their patients with ulcers to understand self-care is better? I've just, turned, I've just turned you off, I think. So that's not good. I tried to turn my monitor off, but I think I put you on silent. So I think that the question was in relation to how do you get, let's call it that matriarchal nurse who won't actually start to embrace this to do something different. And um, I think it's a challenge, um, but I think it's about talking to them about the advantages. I think the simple analogy of many nurses think that it's it's too dangerous to let them self-care um, because what if just what if and I, I I always go back to the analogy of if you go to your doctors with a strep infection and he gives you some antibiotics he doesn't say I'll see you back in four days just in case he says if you know better in four days come back to see me if you've got any signs of sepsis in that time you go straight to A&E and that's how we need to be approaching this I think that we've got to remember that we ask patients to deliver their own insulin. We, we don't need to hold on to our patients in the same way that we think we should. I also think that don't see this as a cop out. Imagine you being that patient, which would you prefer? I know I'd prefer four weeks supply of dressings, four weeks supply of compression, an appointment to come back to see you in four weeks from now, along with education of what I'm looking for, what is an infection, who do I ring if I've got one? So I've got that assurance behind me. But we have to be breaking this down. The NHS is unsustainable as we currently are. We need to be focusing on where do we truly need our nurses support? And actually, if you've got a patient with a standard venous leg ulcer who's suitable for self-care, they do not need nurse support. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so question two is from uh, Debbie. I assessed the patient in the community following a Doppler or ABPI assessment and set her up with hosiery kit, but despite my best efforts, she could not tolerate wearing them. Do you have any tips or suggestions? Yeah, it, it's about working with your patient. You know, this pathway and this algorithm is there to, to steer clinical decision making, but there's always an individualised patient behind it. So it's about asking her, why didn't you like it? So we, did she not like it because it was digging in her toes? Well, that's easy. We get her an open toe one. Did she not like it because um, it was digging in and causing some, some gathering of her edema? If so, were it the right stocking? Do you need an actual European stocking? Did she not like it because she couldn't get it on? There's loads of aids out there available within the NHS to help her, help them. Or did she not like it because she wants a degree of padding and security if she bangs a leg? then it might be more protected. Well, if that's the case, let's think about a compression wrap system on her that gives a lot more protection of that vulnerable limb. So it's about really that, Debbie, talking to your patients of the why. 
and you'll have asked the five whys, keep going down the line and you will get to the root cause of what is that patient's resistance to it. It all has to be on a background though of you telling the patients of the reason of the compression in the first place. We have to be salespeople of compression. We have to be saying that you have got chronic inflammation inside because of the high pressure of your veins. That's causing a chronic inflammation inside and that's why your leg is so sore and that's why you've got these symptoms. What we need to do is we need to push all of that fluid and all of those irritants back into your veins. The best way to do with this is this potent anti-inflammatory compression device. This therapy is gonna reduce all of that inflammation for you. Do you know what? It might be a little bit uncomfortable for the next two weeks as that inflammation starts to go down. But I promise you in two weeks, you'll start to see your legs getting smaller, your extra dates getting less, and then your wound will start to get better. And it's just the way we sell it to the patients that we need to get better at. If somebody come up to you, Sam, and said, would you have this tight bandage on you? Your instant reaction is no. It's about the way that we sell it. Yeah, 100%. Perfectly put as well. So um, on to question three, uh, what about patients with edema above the knee and can they self-care? Oh, well, whoever put that question, Bramley points top of the class for you. Um, it's dead easy to become a practitioner that just looks from the toes to the knees and forgets to go a little bit higher. Um, absolutely, we need to be assessing the knee and the thigh. Um, we need to be assessing that in terms of if we're squeezing that edema into this area, it's not going to be any good. We need to support that. Absolutely, you can get knee thigh pieces and thigh pieces to be able to squeeze that in terms of compression wraps. Remember, you can get your compression hosiery in tight stockings as well, at thigh length stockings. So it's about thinking about tailoring it to that individual approach. And um, we're moving a little bit away from what I class as standard leg ulcer care, which is in the pathway, and we're moving more towards complexity of leg ulcer care. But when you talk about complexity of leg ulcer care, it's about individualizing patients. So, for example, if you've got lower uh, swelling of your thigh, sometimes I use a European class two all the way up to the thigh, and then a compression wrap built on the calf. Or sometimes I put a compression bandage up to the calf and then a compression wrap system onto the thigh. So it's just about tailoring, but I'd say that becomes a bit more specialized um, and have a look at, the, at some of the documents um, about the complexities of venous leg ulceration. There's one that's published, um, I think that's sponsored by LNR as well. It's the best practice statement um, that's out there about complexities and it just goes through a bit of those nuances. Brilliant. And I'm sure we'll be able to, to get a link to that. If it's not immediately, we'll be able, be able to put that in the comments section as well. So uh, keep an eye out for that. Uh, question four from Rebecca. When is the best time to measure for hosiery kit when in bandages? As soon as you can is the answer. So if you remember the two questions, if the patient's in a bandage, is the extra date control within the dressing? Is the limb volume reduced? As you can measure for a patient whilst they've still got large volumes of exudate, it won't make a difference. But we've got to make sure if you're going to, if they're in a bandage because of limb distortion and limb swelling, we've got to get that down first to a near normal profile or mild edema before we step them down. So we should only be, we should only be measuring them when we've eliminated that edema. And remember, when you're stepping them down, you have to go from one to the other instantly. So if you've measured them today, you're in compression bandaging and you've ordered the compression hosiery, you're going to keep them in that bandage until you've got that compression hosiery in hand. You're going to take one off and put one on instantly. If not, you'll just get rebound edema. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, question five. Wraps and hosiery kits are more expensive than bandaging. So how does it save the NHS money? Well, there you go. Um, and that's because whoever's asked that question is looking basically at a unit cost. A couple of things with that. If you were to buy one, absolutely a compression wrap system is much more expensive than a £10 bandage, much more. But a compression wrap system, you need two of them and they'll last you three months. If you were in bandaging, you need a £10 bandage every week for three months. That becomes more expensive. 
a Legos a hosiery kit, they're about 20 quid ish. Don't quote me on the prices. But about 20 pound ish. Again, you only need two of them, it'll last you six months. So actually, rather than 10 pound bandaging, easy. That's just on a unit cost. So we don't need to be comparing unit cost to unit cost, it's usage cost across the patch. Then on top of that, forget the price of the compression, forget the price of the dressings. The most expensive thing about all of this is you in terms of your time. It costs about £69 for a nurse to visit you at home. Doesn't take many £69 to be able to justify the price of a compression wrap system if that patient can self-care, easily justified. It's about sitting down with a person who is saying no to this and actually giving them a little cost analysis of this versus this versus this. Dead easy to do. And actually that'd be a great idea for our next publication. And we could help you with that of just devising an easily grid tool in terms of looking at the cost in terms of unit cost and also nursing time. But you need to challenge that head on. The biggest price is the fact that we're only healing patients 37% at 12 months nationally with venous leg ulceration. That's where the cost is coming from. That's where the billions of pounds is coming from. It's by poor care, harmful care, elongating patient suffering. It's not about delivering evidence-based therapy. All of these systems that we've talked about are embraced within good clinical guidance with good supporting clinical evidence. It's what we should be doing. Yeah, absolutely spot on. Um, question six then from Alison. How do you get GPs on board with lower limb care that's been a challenge for us, uh, standardising care in our PCNs. Okay, so it depends on what you talk about uh, uh, GPs. So um, truthfully, the best way to get GPs involved, stop them. <laughs> it's the easiest way is just stop them. And actually, the best way to do that is develop a really good system that actually if the patient presents to a GP practice front door receptionist, they don't actually see the GP to go and see an appropriate individual right from the very get-go. It's a dead win to that for a GP if you simply say to them, I don't want you to see venous leg ulcers, I prefer to see them. They'll be in for it because it's less patients for them instantly. So I think it's about what you're giving back, you're giving that GP back space because you're taking them away. It's then about the long-term engagement. So it's about just slowly tapping at them. So just leave a publication out on the table you know, show them some of the evidence, show them some of your outcomes. If you're going to do a, um, a clinical governance meeting or a target meeting, just show them some of your benefits of using these type of systems and look at your outcomes. It's great to raise your individual profile, but it's also helpful in terms of slowly chipping away of making them see the light. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, question seven then. What would you class as effective uh, 20 mmg of compression to treat a venous leg ulcer? Oh, so hang on. Remember that 20 is not treatment dose. 20 is first aid, if you like, dose. For treatment dose, it's at least 40 milligrams of mercury pressure. And for that, we should be using compression hosiery kits, compression bandaging, full strength, uh, or um, compression wrap systems. In terms of that 20 millimeter mercury, first aid compression, if you ask me, there is no easy answer to that. What I can tell you fits in that categorization is definitely class one British stockings, they're below that 20. Some of the compression wrap systems, if you've got a device that you're able to measure the amount of compression on it, some of them you may be able to get below 20. I have fears of that, that the patient might actually put it on themselves too tight, and actually we haven't done the whole assessment that we need. There is some compression bandage systems that's on the market called reduce or modified compression. But be careful. The recommendation is up to 20. So if that bandage provides 23, it falls outside of that guidance. You shouldn't be applying it without a full holistic assessment. See, if you are using reduced bandaging, you've got to know what your manufacturer is saying in terms of what they deliver, and it's got to be under 20. There's other things you can use. It's not brilliant. Tubi grip, it's, it's, it's cylindrical rather than graduated, but it's definitely under 20. I think that there is a definitely a marketeer somewhere who should be able to produce as a brilliant bandage 
or something that falls underneath that 20. For me in my clinical practice at this moment in time, I go for two things. Tube grip, knowing that it's cylindrical, or a class one British stockkin as my holding place. But that's only a holding place and that should only be used for 14 days maximum until you complete that full holistic assessment, ABPI, and get them into proper strong compression of at least 40 milligrams of mercury pressure. Brilliant, thank you. Um, we've got two more questions, if we can get through those two. Um, first one from Rebecca is, once they are healed, do you then maintain with class two compression? Another great question. So the guidance says to maintain them in as strong a compression as possible. Remember that guidance. So let's say if you've got a patient who's in a compression hosiery kit, likes it, able to put it on and off because of that low profile, you can actually maintain them in that forever. The recommendation is, is as much compression as possible. The guidelines used to say at least class three, but they never told us whether we're British or European. A lot of people interpret that as a class two, but again, there's a big difference between class two British and class two European. So what I would say is try to get your patients in the strongest compression on a long term that they will cope with. If you're gonna use British standard, use class two, but make sure they've got a no edema. If they've got some edema, put them in, in European standard stockings. Watch them though, do a check on them in six weeks from now and have a look. Is that stocking or that level of compression still being therapeutic? In other words, you've got no recurrence of edema. You've got no recurrence of that venous inflammation that we can see around the gait region. We've got no venous eczema or any weeping areas starting. If you've got any of those things coming, it's telling you you need a stronger compression or a different type of compression, such as switching from British to European. Again, it's a little bit confusing, but what Eleanor has got is some fantastic resources out there that actually demystifies all of this in terms of these clinical symptoms, this is what you need, and these are the strengths that you have. Perfect, thank you. Uh, then on to the final question then. Uh, what is the difference between light, classic and strong wraps? Um, it's very confusing on what to use. Oh, I know it is. So um, I would say don't go on the title because there is a light wrap out there that's not light, it still gives sparta. That's just how it's light because they've branded it light because the material's a little bit lighter. All of the compression wraps that are sold throughout the UK are designed to give 40, 30, 20 profile. Like I said, some of them you can use on a, on a different tab, if you like, so therefore you get less compression. But they're all designed to use 40, 30, 20. What I'd say with all of this is, if you're a novice in all of this, because it's very confusing, is just learn to know one good wrap system. Learn it inside out, learn its pros, learn its cons, work, work with it on a regular basis. And um, I work with two different wrap systems, one of them being LNR ready wrap and a different wrap system. Um, but I only work with two and there's about 10 of them on the market because it's too much even for my brain to hold and, 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 and this is all I do. And um, so I would just say, get used to whatever you're using, think about it and actually try to deliver that 40, 30, 20. We've got to get these patients with venous leg ulcer with a diagnosis and a normal ABPI into that strong compression. Anything less than 40 milligrams of mercury, in Alison Hopkins's words, you're tickling the leg, it's sub-therapeutic, it's like giving one paracetamol. We need to be aiming for that 40. Brilliant. Fantastic way to finish. Thank you, Leanne. Uh, thank you very much for that session and for answering all those questions. Some really, really insightful uh, answers there. Thank you everyone for submitting the questions. If we didn't get to yours, then we will answer those in the comments in the next few days as well. A uh, huge thank you to Eleanor for supporting the event. We wouldn't be able to put on these events without uh, their support. So big, big thank you to them. Uh, certificate links will now be available in the comments section. So uh, they should be on the screen as well. So if you uh, want to click on the link and download that for your revalidation re portfolio, uh, the recording and the slides will also go onto our website along with the certificate link. So that will be available uh, probably tomorrow and uh, you can re-watch it 
watch me and Leanne back if you like and uh, and uh, take all the slides and uh, make some notes on those if you need them to. Uh, make sure you're following our Facebook page for any future events. We've got um, the GPM page, our sister journal site. Uh, that one has the first part of the Lego series, so the link for that should be in the comments as well. And we are back on the 20th of October on our Wound Care Today website. Uh, which is another one of our sister journals. And uh, we've got another session with Dr. Leanne on compression in heart failure, uh, compression heart failure, sorry, harmful or necessary. So please sign up for that and we'll hopefully see you there again. Thank you very much and uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you again, Leanne. You've been fantastic and I'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye.